all. Um, very welcome to the Atlantic Festival. Our 2022 theme is the art of digital acceleration and we're on day two. So hopefully you've all had an opportunity to join a session at this stage. And if not already, we're delighted to have you on board with us today. This is our eighth year in existence and running a packed event across five days with 35 events and 40 plus speakers. So for the whole festival, you can follow us on Twitter and use the hashtag Atlantic. I'm delighted to be here as your event moderator. My name is Karen Conway. I work with Fidelity Investments for almost 20 years. Yes, we won't talk about the age, covering a variety of roles. And I've traveled to the US, Europe and Asia on a number of occasions. From an ITAG perspective, I'm involved in the AI Forum, where I'm a member of a fantastic team with representation from many companies working in AI across the Atlantic Gateway. I recently completed the AI for Managers Level 9 postgrad from Inuai Galway, which was launched in September 2021 and will be rerunning again in September 2022. And it's an excellent foundation for anybody who's kind of newer to the topic of AI. From a Q&A perspective, I'll be tracking your questions. You can use the Q&A function. It's over here on the right-hand side. It's kind of the third tab in. So if you have any questions, you can just pop them in there and I'll read out any questions for you. There's also an anonymous option. So if you're shy posting the questions, you can always use that option as well. A quick call out to our sponsors. So I, I do see them up on the screen here, but um, these, these sponsors ensure this event happens. So we do want to say a thank you for your continued generosity and support. And that's Avaya, Cisco, Fidelity Investments, NUI Galway, Genesis, Galway Advertiser, ITAC Skillnet and Storm Technology. And now let's jump to the real reason we're here. A very, very warm welcome to Alexandria Deshaun Sonsino. Alexandria is an author, consultant, public speaker, entrepreneur and designer living in London. She wrote Smarter Homes, How Technology Will Change Your Home Life, and her new book, Creating a Culture of Innovation, is out later this year. She's founder of the Low Carbon Design Institute, a resi residency for creative people focused on climate change. She ran the Internet of Things meetup in London for eight years, one of the largest in the world, and helped the community create Better IoT, a free checklist to help founders and product managers make more ethical decisions. She was the founder of the Goodnight Lamp, a connected product for global families included in the permanent collection of the London Design Museum as a key example of the Internet of Things. She co-founded Tinker London, the first distributor of the Arduinos, the open source electronics education platform that kicked off the maker movement. Two of her projects are in the permanent collection of the Museum of Modern Art in New York. She studied industrial design at the University of Montreal and interaction design at the Interaction Design Institute at IVEA in Italy. So with that remarkable bio, I'm absolutely delighted to welcome the wonderful Andrea to the stage. Thank you, Andrea. We're, we're delighted to hear your speech and really looking forward to it. Hi, thank you, Karen. Thank you for having me. Um, thank you everyone for joining. This is the afternoon. It's what they used to call the graveyard slot. So right after lunch, I really appreciate it. Uh, and I really appreciate you uh, taking the time to hear about ethics, which is always one of those topics that I think people would rather um, listen to a lot of other corporate PowerPoints rather than listen to ethics. And so I really, yeah, I really appreciate it. Um, I'm going to share my screen in the usual ways and hopefully you will let me know if you do not see anything and I will just carry on. Um, so my name is Alexandra de Chansoncino. I'm half Italian, half Canadian. Everyone, uh, I'm based in South London and I'm dialing in from my home office as is uh, the new normal. Um, please reach me if you have any questions after this talk as well. I'm uh, on LinkedIn on, um, and yeah, I'm very open and available. Um, a little bit about the last few years of work a fabulous job of sort of giving an overview, but essentially the last uh, few years of my career have been focused on climate-related work as well as ethics-related work, which is what I'm bringing here today. The books I've written, actually creating a culture of innovation is already out. It's been out since 2020. Um, and uh, the little book of public space and the internet of things is actually available for free. So if you don't want to buy the two other books, you can find that one for free. I'm going to start us off uh, with something that feels kind of weird in an ethics talk, but I think is important. Um, this is the expected global e-waste generation of the next um, decades. And it's not going down, it's going up. 
And I think it's an interesting reminder um, that when we talk about ethics and technology, sometimes what we're really talking about is the environment. And so it's not only about doing the right thing and about enabling people to sleep better at night, um, but it's also tangibly about making a difference and possibly making a difference to this particular number. I'll come back to this a lot. What I'm also going to talk about are um, examples that I've picked throughout the years, throughout my career. I started selling the Arduino in the UK in 2007. We're very, very um, far from that world now. And I'm going to really mention examples that are across the board from single founders to small teams to larger service providers, uh, because that ecology still exists. It still exists now. I hope that these examples that are a little bit older help you understand that this is a conversation that is yet to be resolved and that talking about ethics and technology is a complicated thing that we will continue to have discussions on. I will also attempt to make links to much uh, more, um, I guess, uh, dedicated efforts, especially in the UK. Uh, there are dedicated efforts everywhere in the world. So if you're dialing in from somewhere else, you will find that probably your local government or your local university has some local efforts that you can use. Uh, but I'm using most of the examples or examples uh, that are a little bit local to me and known to me. So um, when we talk about e-waste, we're really talking about stuff that ends up in landfill that shouldn't. Um, why is that? Well, sometimes it's because people have um, either attempted something too early uh, or not been able to, you know, keep things going. So the Nabas tag, for those of you who saw, um, is just on a shelf behind me, actually, I have an example, um, was the first commercial connected product. Um, this was sold as part of a broadband package because back in 2006 you kind of had to convince people to buy a broadband package in their home um, and you got a free rabbit and a person that maybe was a family member, maybe was someone that you um, liked, would get a corresponding rabbit. And so you would move the ears of one rabbit and the corresponding rabbit move because they were both on Wi-Fi because you were both signed up to broadband at home. Um, very early, I mean, this is pre-smartphones, this is pre, um, you know, 4G, 5G, 6G, um, and this was really unusual. This didn't necessarily fare it all that well. The founder, um, Rafi Halajan, is still around. He's still building connected product experiences in France. At the time, this was, you know, a pioneering project, really. Uh, they sold the company to a robotics company. That company then um, didn't really know how to maintain the product. The product line eventually was discontinued. Um, and um, those are still products that I think some of us who are old enough to have been around the block are uh, sentimental about. But essentially, this will be new to many of you because that product line has disappeared for so long. Um, other products are you know, successful because people are, get kind of burnt out. Uh, N-Cube was something that on the face of it should have been extremely ethical, extremely interesting. It was a little um, home hub for your data, for all the sensors that you might have around your home. That might be a smart thermostat, that might be your cameras, etc. cetera. Um, and um, that smart... Um, hub would basically keep that data local and not share it um, in any way that wasn't GDPR compliant. So really interesting from an ethics perspective. Um, the founder, um, Philip Steele, sort of kicked that around for a while and then eventually, you know, didn't necessarily have enough of a market and that product line was discontinued. Little printer was even more of a um, sort of weird connected product. I also have one on the shelf behind me. Um, and this was really for a, um, a more entertainment and I would say uh, more of an even niche product line. But um, this was a bit of a darling in the Silicon Roundabout days in London, in East London in the early 2000s. 
tens. Uh, and uh, this was a little tiny printer, thermal printer, and you could subscribe to publications that would get printed at different times of the day. So you could get the Sudoku of the day, or you could, I mean, it would be Wordle these days. Um, you could get uh, the Guardian's sort of top news. You could get all sorts of things. And you could also send images to it that would get sent to someone else's little printer. So you could remotely sort of send them little pictures or drawings. Um, really clever, really interesting, the people behind it good friends of mine came from a design background, from a creative technology background. The whole product line was made um, and designed um, as a mixture of kind of Chinese manufacturing, Eastern European manufacturing, really, you know, a huge effort. Uh, but after a few thousand units, then um, the entire company kind of shut down. And so a sort of huge amount of effort, a huge amount of resources uh, for a product line that doesn't necessarily last. Um, sometimes it's because, you know, there's other things going on and it's very hard to tell what exactly is going on. Uh, Vinaya was a London-based wearables company. They had a small that came from a background in not necessarily electronics, um, but fashion design. They came up with a few products and then eventually uh, put Zen, which was their newest product, um, on crowdfunding. They raised a huge amount of money for crowdfunding for 2016 for that kind of product um, and uh, then swiftly disappeared and the backers never got word of what had happened. Uh, the founder has mostly sort of disappeared off social media and um, the company went bankrupt in a really inelegant way. And so that product line um, really didn't materialize at all, which is even worse. Uh, but the people who had the former products that Vinaya was making obviously suddenly had something that was no longer supported. And so again, something that ends up in the bin because there's literally no way, uh, not only for you to get it to work, but you can't even sell it on a secondary market because there's just no one to buy it. You know, I could keep going with examples and some of them really last for a while. I mean, six years is a long time for any company. Most companies will fail after two, as we all know. Um, that doesn't change with digital products. It doesn't change with teams that are building digital products. And certainly in the hardware space, it also doesn't change. Um, others are, you know, sort of still. Um, and so. In the case of Ohm, which was started by John Nessie and Avril O'Neill, who are good friends of mine, um, they sold the company and this smart product, which was a smart doorbell, onto someone who had stock because they had stock, but you just, just couldn't make things work anymore. Um, and that person is now trying to get, you know, sell that stock and maintain that product line. In some instances, it's what I would qualify as more um, kind of dangerous or not so dangerous and um, sort of waving at the possibility of a product line, but never really delivering on the actual product. So um, I had yeah. a department working on some technology um, that uh, wove inside of a jacket, inside of a Levi's jacket, you'd be able to control your mobile from the sleeves. So if you were cycling, you would just sort of swipe your sleeve gently without having to look at a screen. Um, that product and that commuter jacket, no one I know has ever been able to show me one. Um, and the Levi's website still had that product um, advertised as, you know, buy now and you would go now and it would never go to a place where you could buy anything um, and that page didn't exist or it didn't even you know give you an explanation as to what had happened to that product line i appreciate that a lot of this stuff is sometimes purely for marketing purposes um, but you know i also in the back of my mind know that someone has made 50 of these and the 50 have ended up in someone's hands you know probably super early adopters uh, and again, that product line doesn't get maintained and those jackets get possibly thrown away or washed once too many times. And then the electronics get, you know, um, to be a someone who's wearing them um, and it still gets, you know, sent God knows where. 
some items, of course, are more or even more kind of um, guilty of this. So uh, uh, Google Glass and Snapchat spectacles, um, which, you know, this is a conversation we've been having since 2013 about whether people are or are not comfortable with cameras on their glasses. I think the general answer has been no, but it doesn't keep people from attempting. <laughs> um, and so we keep products that are um, trying to find a market continuously. Um, but if you look at Snapchat, Snapchat spectacles, especially, there were really horrible pictures of um, hundreds of those spectacles being put into bins and then discarded. Um, we know that if something is uh, supposedly recycled, it, or rather recyclable, which in this case, I don't think they could ever claim, um, but we know that uh, so many times these items are not in fact recycled at all. And it's extremely unlikely that Snapchat would have even had the tools at their disposal to disassemble. And so again, this would have just ended up being thrown away. In other cases, what happens is that, you know, Acqui hires are sort of a better strategy uh, that end up creating new waste because again, a product line gets abandoned because there's literally no one to work on the product anymore. And so in the case of Lapka, Lapka, uh, bought a connected sensor startup, or Airbnb bought them, and they were a connected sensor startup. They had some very pretty items. They were very beautiful, a lot of ceramics, a lot of wood. Uh, the material choices were really clever. Um, obviously, from our experience collectively of Airbnb, they've never done anything with that product line because um, you know, they've never sort of invested in hardware, really. So this was just a way to get um, a bunch of founders who were quite clever to come and work for Airbnb. Um, I should look up as to whether those people ever stayed there for very long. I suspect they did not. Sometimes it's easy to um, wash your hand of your corporate responsibility just by selling to the neighbor. Um, and in other instances, it's uh, even here when the acqui hire actually specifically leads to a breach of terms and conditions. So this was a very, at the time, um, very big deal. Uh, Revolve was a company that made a home hub that connected to all your sensors in your home. Um, they shut down because they were actually acquired by Google Nest's team and Google Nest uh, decided to shut down the product line except the terms and conditions of customers that had bought Revolve was that they would get lifelong support. And suddenly life meant the life of a product as much as uh, Google was willing to support, which was not. Um, huge uproar, the developer community was up in arms and eventually Google had to say, okay, well, we'll, you know, support it for a little while. Uh, but that's not a particularly elegant process, of course. This is another acquisition again. Um, and sometimes the acquisitions are made in such a way that um, for this, in this particular case, uh, there wasn't a product that was physically made. This was a digital assistant, let's say, um, via a chat platform that would help you manage all your um, all your devices. But if you you suddenly sort of lose that particular function, lose that particular app, um, then can you manage all your devices in the same way? And if you don't, if there's no replacement, do you end up sort of chucking away a whole bunch of sensors in your home because there's no way for you to manage, manage them properly. So the secondary implications of someone failing are also is also something that not every company is necessarily uh, going to think about. And before you tell me that, you know, this is all kind of old news, um, I keep an eye on these things. I've been keeping an eye on these things for a very long time. And this is from uh, literally last week. Uh, where on Twitter someone says my window blinds won't open because of an expired certificate. And so this is and has become the reality for um, a number of different kinds of devices and a number of different kinds of customers. So 
you know, what we see is that service providers are, um, they have a role to play in how things are connected, disconnected, used, misused, discarded. But in, in between the Consumer Protection Act and the GDPR or whatever replaces the GDPR in the UK, um, there isn't really that kind of liability that makes them responsible for those devices. Um, and any failures of user experience, any failures uh, from a design perspective just does just turn into e-waste. Um, and so we really have to sort of confront this. So what um, myself as, at the time um, with the Internet of Things community in the UK started doing is looking at these issues uh, very specifically. We ran an event in 2012 and then we ran another event in 2017 and for a period of two years worked on something called Better IoT. Uh, you can find it at betteriot.org. Um, Initially, the purpose was to try to find and try to develop a certification scheme in the same way that we have CE, we have UL, we have all sorts of schemes that protect customers because products are being tested in a particular way. We thought, isn't there a way to make quote unquote good product design um, something that someone can sign up to and say, I'm doing all these things. What we found out was that because of the kinds of products we were talking about, which had a physical component, a digital component, um, every single product has things um, that are unique to it. And that means that a set of criteria that you could apply to every single product type doesn't exist. But there are commonalities and there are categories of questions that we can ask someone to think about. And so Better IoT is, in fact, just a, a questionnaire. And that questionnaire gets you to think about privacy, transparency, ownership models, security, life cycle, interoperability, openness. Um, and this is something that is um, open, free, no matter you know, what level someone's at, and even really you know, no matter what kind of product they're thinking about. They can answer as um, yes, no, not sure, or not applicable. Because again, the difference between developing a connected lamp uh, or a connected sensor on a turtle for conservation reasons, you know, the two things share very little and there are some elements which really simply don't apply. So I'm going to dig a little bit into this um, for the next sort of five minutes or so, and then I'll take a step back to also that are happening in the space of thinking about and talking about ethics and technology. Um, so interoperability, I kind of pointed at Revolve um, as an example of something that obviously was not very interoperable with anything else. But you know, the question you could ask yourself is how easy is it to transfer um, the product and its technology infrastructure from one service to another in case that company fails or that product line fails? Um, are APIs available so that others can build on top of what you've built? This is, you know, some of this is really applicable to digital only products as well. But of course, in the world of connected product experiences, it's especially stressful, let's say. Openness is really one of the more, um, you could say political things. I don't think of it as particularly political, but um, how much is published as an open source um, license under an open source license, either once the, sh the company shuts down or even while the product is still available. What is it about the product that absolutely can't be open source and absolutely must be protected and, you know, being realistic about that. Um, so in there and in the questionnaire, we sort of hint at uh, whether you might open source the firmware, the hardware, the back end of the service. Um, and this has proven to be useful for two of the examples I've given you earlier. So Nabastag, event company that had sold the company and kind of discontinued it, just open sourced the documentation. And so someone has been very slowly and with a lot of love and care has been rebuilding the entire technology infrastructure in order to quote unquote resurrect the first internet connected bunny. Uh, a little printer, which I talked about, has also had a similar experience because all of the backend service became open source 
and was open sourced, which meant that someone very recently in the last three years has been building a new life for this particular product. So as long as you have the hardware, um, you can upload the new firmware and use the new backend service because it doesn't use the same servers as, you know, uh, Berg, the company matter because the hardware can still exist and can still serve its purpose. Another area which we discussed as a group, which I think is really key, is data governance. So some of you who are perhaps more GDPR inclined, more legally inclined and otherwise, you'll know what I mean by that. But um, thinking about how it's for a customer, a consumer, a user, um, to understand that a product is tied to an element of connectivity. So that if they go into an area that is disconnected, perhaps the core functionality of the product stops. Or if they want to disconnect that product, there's legal ramifications. The example I give here on the right-hand side is the fact that in some uh, parts of the United States, you can get access to a car even if your credit line is extremely poor. But as, as soon as you hit sort of a week before your car payment is due, there is an alarm on the dashboard that will start to sound. And the day that the payment is due and that payment has not been made, the car will stop in the middle of the highway as you are getting your kids to work. And so understanding for the consumer, for that person who is buying into this particular scheme to understand the ramification of that connectivity, to say, oh, okay, I might be stopped in the middle of the highway while trying to get my kids to school that morning. Um, and that's a really you know, tricky one. But if it's not clear, then you have this ambivalence and these user experiences, which are extremely poor. Permission and ownership is another one that I think is really important. Um, we talked about this in the context of uh, an example which I lived through. So uh, British Gas Hive, which some of you may or may not be familiar with. I had the first um, version of it. This version, uh, if you can see my cursor on the right hand side and it became kind of prettier and prettier. But the first ever version, which was the early adopter version I installed in the flat I was living in at the time, I moved, I expected British Gas to be able to take that hardware and reinstall it in the new flat, but they didn't want to. They asked me to buy the product again at a small rebate, um, which is absolutely about uh, you know lowering the engineering costs as much as possible, and I get that, but it was kind of a little bit confusing. And not only that, but I also had to uh, come up with a new account. I couldn't untether my account, my digital uh, life with this product. I couldn't untether it and point it at the new device. I had to actually, you know, choose another email address and start another account. So I think that technically speaking, I still have control over my old smart thermostat, which, you know, boggles the mind. Um, and so that is really about handling permission, handling ownership. A lot of connected product experiences are very, very poor at multi-user profiles. Um, we know, you know that people like to use things collaboratively. Netflix is a really good example of something that is available to the whole family. Um, and being able to do that elegantly and respect you know, data pools that are in data lakes that are created, if you will, per user is really important. Security is a really big one. I know some of you will be much more versed than I am in this, but we point in the questionnaire at several security standards. Even the UK government has its own secure by design um, sort of papers that they've published to say these are some of the things that you may want to look at and you may want to implement if you're doing something that is a connected and complex service. Um, I think this is also the bit that's the easiest for part of the digital community to wrap them, their head around. And it's also easier to just give that to the IT department and to go, just make it secure. But I do think all these other elements that I've talked about and all the other sections of the questionnaire are really important. And so it's too easy to say that 
security is really the prime kind of factor in making sure that these experiences are done well and are built well and you know make people happy. I end with the bit that I think is the most uh, exciting bit also um, and really encourage you to look at Restart. I'm one of their trustees. Um, and it, it's just to talk about life cycle. So it's all very well building a super secure device um, in an environment where people really understand the mechanisms and the underpinnings of that service. But if that product can't be repaired easily physically, and it's dropped in your home, in your work, wherever on the factory floor, uh, then it's sort of neither here nor there, it's still going to end up in landfill. And so Restart, our um, Right to Repair campaign organization, they are one of the co-founders of the European Right to Repair campaign um, and really worth kind of looking at what they're doing. Uh, but they came in and helped us build a few questions just to say, you know, are you providing spare parts by default? Is it really complicated for me to get spare parts? Um, is this easy uh, to disassemble? And has it been designed in such a way that it's easy to disassemble? These are all questions that either a product designer, industrial designer, product manager, and even the CEO of a company can look at and go, oh, yeah, we haven't you know, considered this. So Better IoT was just you know, a community effort to try to answer these questions. It's not the uh, only thing out there. I really recommend all these other efforts, whether that's the Ada Lovelace Institute, the Alan Turing Institute, the British Standards Institute as well has some guidelines, um, but all these other projects are there and have been contributing to the space of talking about ethics in these complicated spaces. Um, some efforts are, more, you know, have been more limited, but I really wanted to still sort of um, share them. The Trustable Tech Mark, which lasted a year or so, um, Dot Everyone's Consequence Scanning Kit is excellent. Um, and in other countries, of course, that are slightly more advanced, um, this is the Singaporean cybersecurity label. Um, this is something that kind of gives you a label for cybersecurity. Again, security is only one aspect of this, but uh, I think it's great that they actually have something that they're attempting. And there's lots of other ways and other mechanisms to talk more broadly and think more broadly about ethics, about risk, about, um, you know, imagining what happens to a product, whether it's digital only or um, even in writing. So this is full facts, um, own uh, what they call the risk pagoda. Uh, and so this is thinking about in information and thinking about what the risk of uh, disinformation are. And I like how they've sort of cut this up. Um, Gresby, which is a real estate portfolio rating, they have ways of showing people, you know, how they're doing and how well they're doing by comparing them. And they show this in a very visual way. So this helps people make decisions in relation to others. So imagine a certification scheme that, you know, was shared with others to begin with. Um, and then you can see how you're faring against your peers, but also how you're faring in your economy in your country with your peers. Um, other types of schemes are becoming more and more important to other areas of your businesses. Uh, so ESG, environmental social governance ratings, are now baked into a lot of financial reporting. And some of these ratings are public. And so you can go and Google the ESG rating for a company. And that means that, that those ways of disclosing, this is where we're doing well, this is where we're not doing well, that helps everyone have a conversation about ethics that is public, essentially. And I'm finishing up um, with uh, another project that I was involved in um, last year called the Human Values Framework. This is a project by the BBC's own R&D, where they looked at digital spaces only and how those digital spaces can affect these 12 human values. Um, they identify them as universal human values. And what we did was build a questionnaire again with 72 different questions that you can look at in order to see whether your digital product only is supporting these values. So I like this project a lot because it's really about um, talking about values rather than talking about, you know, uh, measuring harm. And so the 
you know, the, the whole conversation is kind of turned on its head. And they very recently ran um, a whole series of workshops as part of the Mozilla Ethical Dilemma Cafe last month. Um, so Mozilla is also an organization that's been sort of supporting um, their work. And I recommend you have a look at that. So uh, really, the only thing I'd like to leave you with is, you know, pick a tool, any tool. It kind of doesn't matter which one of these you decide to go with. Uh, making space in your business and in your digital business for ethics, I think, is important. Um, making you know, some kind of commitment to any tool just to try it is already better than doing nothing. And then making the time, involving as many people as you can from your organization, not just the ones that you think are involved in the product deeply, but people who are also not so involved because they'll bring in something else. And try to see whether your company isn't, in fact, doing ESG reporting already and that this conversation around ethics can support what they're doing and can get your organization moving differently and thinking ethically. So thank you so, so very much for uh, taking the time. And I realize there's no age, so uh, apologies for that. And I will stop sharing. Wonderful. Um, Maybe I suppose these are just in my head at the moment. When I saw you first talking about e-waste, like in my head, I automatically went to data and all the storage. Do you con do you go into that kind of in terms of how much data we're storing and whether we really need to do that and the waste that'll be around that? Yeah, I mean, there's some wonderful people around us, the Green Web Foundation, which is based in Berlin. Um, they're a fantastic organization that really companies to think about, you know, the, about their data capture, thinking about their data storage, thinking about how they stay compliant with GDPR because you have to provide some history around the data that you are capturing, but just also giving people the sense that, you know, I'm, I'm thinking in terms of um, data capture. Does every sensor on your factory floor have to capture a second of use uh, if all that happens is that at the end of a quarter someone does one powerpoint slide in order to ascertain whether you know you should continue buying from that vendor or not just having a, a bit of a, a conversation with yourself i think a green web foundation would be a really good resource to look at very good. Yeah, it was just uh, came into mind when I kind of saw the e-waste. Just another thing you mentioned was that crowdsourcing funded one of the programs. And while this isn't quite a digital ethical question, but like, is there any accountability around the crowdsourcing? Like, I've given you my money. Do I have any accountability? Like, does that person have any accountability to explain to me? No, I mean, it's um, <laughs> the wonderful people at Kickstarter, I think, are extremely aware. They have built a bit of a monster, uh, let's say, uh, because it has become uh, very akin to um, financial investments in general, which is, you know, your money is still at risk in the same way that if you were playing the stock. I think the way in which they structure their TNCs has explained to people that their money is at risk, but does anybody ever read the TNCs? They um, and so making those TNCs front and center and making them much more clear should definitely be an objective, just so that people understand, you know, this might go nowhere. And what you're doing is essentially not so much gambling, but um, certainly taking a gamble. Yeah, it's funny when you talk about the TNCs uh, from my college course that we just finished, did, um, ethics and law was actually one of the the topic so i'm quite interested in what you covered off but one of our lecturers had us read the google privacy uh form it must have been 27 pages and i was like oh any reason that nobody would read this like you know like it's just too long it's not consumable so you know i think to be fair I, there I needs purpose. to be a kind of more readable <laughs> format yeah i was gonna <laughs> say it's, it's absolutely going. done uh, it's absolutely done on purpose it's absolutely because the legal ease isn't really required um, and, and i've worked with a lot of lawyers um it's not a requirement if what you're 
things get people to understand what they should or shouldn't do. But Google has very little interest, I think. Yeah. Now, I am going to invite anybody else to pop in any questions that they choose to, or otherwise I'm just literally going to hog the floor. Uh, I had another question. It's just around the Google Glasses and stuff. So I suppose we're seeing a lot of changes coming in in kind of AI laws. They're advancing the technology. Finally, the law is probably about to catch up with the technology. It's been very far behind. But in, like, in terms of like, you know, we're seeing kind of a pushback on facial recognition now in some countries. And Google Glass there is, is probably one of the keys. So do we see products like, removing features as the laws are catching up? I think it's tricky. I think some people will decide not to deploy their product in particular rooms. We've seen that with GDPR. We've seen people take away certain services, certain access to certain parts of their content just because they don't want to bother with implementing GDPR for a European user. Uh, you'll be familiar, even, you know, DRM, and digital rights management preamble to all of that. Um, you know, what region do I give you the rights to consume a particular product in? Uh, we're used to that fragmentation, but I think it's only going to keep increasing. Um, right to repair law is also another one where um, some geographies it will be required um, for a product to be repairable and others won't have caught up, in which case um, someone will just keep selling their stuff to other countries and will have to develop a niche product line for a subsection of their marketplace. But most major global corporations are used to already thinking in terms of regions and it already thinking in terms of regional support. And so I think it's uh, unfortunately businesses, people, whether the laws change internationally or not, um, that's really the bigger question. If they agents, people will just kind of do things differently in a specific area of the world and deliver a slightly different digital product. Yeah, all right. I suppose you're sending up guidelines for people to follow and stuff like that. What responsibility do you think the government has in like truly implementing that and putting some form of let's say legal implications around it? I mean, I think the really interesting thing is to think about um, the professional frameworks around doctors and around architects and engineers. If a bridge falls down um, or if a car explodes, you can technically send an engineer to prison. If a connected product fails or a digital product fails, there is no one uh, in the, there's no professional body that says, yes, we'll take responsibility. We'll take responsibility for how this is delivered. And this person who said the chief architect or chief engineer, et cetera, uh, will be held liable. That doesn't exist yet. Um, whether it will, I think that's an open question to, in the UK, at least bodies like um, the Institute of Engineers and Technologists. Um, and other professional bodies. But if you hire an architect, an architect will make you sign a 20 pager, you know, to say, this is where I'm liable, this is where I'm not, this is what you can sue me for, this is what you can't. Uh, we don't yet have that for digital work. Um, but, you know, that might come. Yeah. One of the open questions we had in college was whether, you know, all of our programmers and developers, software engineer, whatever level it is, should go through some form of ethical training to understand the implications of what they're building. Well, I think it's really interesting because, again, um, whether you need a class in ethics to understand the consequences of what you're doing. Uh, it should be built into every single conversation you have around a new technology. Uh, there should be no um, optionality to that kind of thinking. That kind of thinking should be built into what makes you a great um, professional. It makes you a great inventor, entrepreneur, uh, programmer and designer. Um, and so it's a shame that it hasn't been this way and that we have tended to, again, because people are not going to jail for their crappy products, um, we have tended to just kind of sweep this under the carpet and think, well, you know, oh, whoops. Um, if people were professionally held liable by professional bodies and there were legal obligations, you can be sure that people would think about ethics. Yeah. 
great thank you i i really really enjoyed this alexandra and i am um, I think I've got, I personally have got a huge amount out of it. So um, I will just kind of last call. I don't think there is any other questions to come in, Andrea, but I certainly, uh, Alexandra, I've certainly had a, a fantastic time talking to you. So I do really appreciate you taking the time to join us today and uh, wish you all the best. And certainly, as you mentioned, people can reach out to you afterwards with any questions and you are on LinkedIn. So I've actually done a reference to you on LinkedIn as well. If people need to look that up, they'll be able to find you there as well. But I really, really appreciate your talk and thank you very much for taking the time to join us today. No, thank, thank you uh, for inviting me and thank you everyone. Have a great rest of the event. Perfect. Great. Thank you. Cheers, Alexandra. Cheers. Bye bye.